thought we'd go through uh, a couple of lectures that we both saw today. The S3 30-day data, I was pretty impressed. 150 patients, 1% uh, mortality in the transfemoral arm, paravalvular leak starting to approach the sort of surgical levels, uh, only 2.6% with moderate or severe paravalvular leak. What did you think? I think it was the big story of the day, Simon. Um, very impressive data. Um, it clearly, uh, the S3 is a significant improvement on the on the XT. Um, small numbers, which gives us, uh, I suppose, a limited scope to interpret that data. But uh, a 14 to 16 French system. We didn't see much in the way of bleeding complications, vascular access complications. Um, the cuff on the um, on the, the valve inflow it's clearly has had an impact on paravalvar leak. Yeah. Um, so again, I suppose um, information suggesting that second generation TAVI are going to uh, improve our patient outcomes, improve procedural safety, um, and will, as suggested by, uh, by John Webb, perhaps allow us to approach intermediate patients going forward. Yeah. Stroke rate, 1% of the transfemoral arm, that's again, again pretty impressive. I was quite interested in some of the procedural aspects, so only 5% of cases were surgical cut down, so there's obviously a, a gradual and impressive move over towards the, the ProStars and the ProGlides, uh, and 30% were with sedation rather than general anaesthetic. I think, I think probably worldwide we've seen that move um, towards less invasive uh, procedures o over the last uh, over the last decade, um, uh, we see more and more conscious sedation rather than trans uh, esophageal echo guided procedures procedures under GA. Um, surgical cut down in most centres would be certainly single digits, um, and uh, and I think that's reflected by by this by this data again high volume centers, very experienced centers performing these, uh, these interventions, interventions with the Sapien 3 and we'll have to wait and see whether these outcomes are reproducible in, in real world clinical practice. What was your experience uh, comparatively in Paris and Montreal in terms of sedation and surgical cut down? Um, by the time I left Paris we had done in the region of 500 TAVIs. Uh, in the two years I was there, uh, for transfemoral cases, we had, a, I think, a less than 1% rate of surgical cutdown. In two years in Montreal, uh, I, had, uh, I saw no cases of, of, uh, of surgical cutdown in transfemoral. And that's using ProStar or ProGlide or combination? Uh, Massey was largely ProStar, uh, and um, Paris, um, sorry, and, uh, and Montreal was, uh, was largely ProGlide. Okay, and in terms of sedation? Uh, Montreal, again, a discrepancy between the two centres. Montreal, largely general anaesthetic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paris, um, for transfemoral procedures, 95%, 100% um, uh, conscious sedation, with, with a, a crossover rate of about, I suppose, 3 to 5%. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is reflected in most of the yeah, single yeah, centre yeah. registries that are available to us. So, if that was the story of the day, I guess the the short story of the day was the Fortis valve with uh, Martin Thomas and Vinnie Bapat reporting four procedures yeah. um, and these were no option patients having percutaneous mitral valve implantation, three of them dead within 75 days. Um, what did you think? I think that um, a transcatheter mitral valve implantation uh, arrived uh, in earnest today. Um, I think we have seen four patients treated um, with variable results. Um, unfortunately when we look at disruptive or breakthrough technologies uh, we sometimes see um, early results that can be disheartening um, but I think, uh, I think that we have to look at the perhaps the, the greater picture. Um, two of these patients had deaths that could have been considered very procedural. Uh, one died at day 76, 
very sick patient with the mm -hmm. ejection mm -hmm. fraction of 10 percent and the third patient or the fourth patient is uh, is alive and well um, again um, encouraging to see that um, the valve was successfully implanted in all four patients all four patients weaned off um, uh, supportive therapy initially post procedurally um, what would have been interesting and what wasn't included in the presentations they were pre and post procedural uh, mitral regurgitation rates um, effective orifice area provided by the valve gradients across the, the, the mitral prosthesis and indeed across the um, uh, across the uh, the LVOT so I suppose we'll have to wait for that data but yep. no doubt it will be forthcoming in, in due course what struck me uh, was that for a TAVI operator it all looked fairly standard procedural activity. I, I, there wasn't anything I saw that thought, oh, I wonder how we're going to do that. So that was reassuring from a sort of structural viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah. I think the transapical system um, is designed for that. It's designed to make the implant as TAVI like as possible, as straightforward as possible. We'll have to wait and see whether that remains the case when we. Um, when we approach these same procedures transeptally uh, and have to try and align these large devices that are 25 to 30 French um, and get coaxial alignment across the mitral valve, that I think will be a, a more challenging, uh, a more challenging procedure. And I, I think reflected in our early transeptal TAVI experience as well, that that was a more difficult approach. So I suppose TAVI first case was 2002 and it was being done reasonably widely 2007 2008 so that's five or six years so 2014 do you think it's been five or six years or do you think it's going to be a bit longer i think it's going to be longer i think when you look at the um the development of mitral and aortic transcatheter therapies probably started around the same time um, TAVI was on a, a different time course, however. Mm. Um, it's taken a lot longer to get the, the mitral prosthesis to, um, to patients because it's a much more involved procedure. There are many more moving parts. Um, we can't anchor um, the device in the same way mm. as we mm. do in, uh, with TAVI. There's the circumflex artery that runs around the mitral area. We've got to consider the LVOT, the thin wall of the um, uh, of the atrium, the subvalvular apparatus. Um, I think um, I don't think we're going to be seeing um, clinicians implanting the mitral valve for, for, it sounds for seven like it's ten years. Far too complicated for interventional cardiologists, if you ask me. Uh, I think we'll get there. Well, we tend to learn quite quickly, and I think even over the course of these four procedures, uh, doctors yeah. uh, Bapat and Thomas. They certainly learn. described a very steep learning curve mm. in terms of their experience. And I think the other thing that's probably to our advantage is that we're all becoming much more comfortable in analyzing CT and 3D echoes. At the start of our TAVI experience, we didn't have that skill set. And I think that's probably reflected in, uh, in earlier um, uh, adverse uh, uh, events that we don't see more recently. Okay, that's great. So I looked through tomorrow's program and I picked out four uh, lectures. One, drug looting balloons, how that features in my clinical practice, uh, which I thought was interesting in that drug looting balloons seem to have lost their way a little recently. No one's quite clear where they should be used, so it'll be interesting to hear someone giving a, uh, a detailed um, view of, of where they think drug looting balloons stand at the moment. The other uh, coronary lecture that I found interesting was about PRAMI. What do you think about the PRAMI trial? It's, um, it's an interesting trial. Um, well run. Um, very provocative results. Um, I think the, the two difficulties that most people would have with the PRAMI trial uh, are first of all that it was stopped early which tends to exaggerate the treatment effect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and if we had crossed over two MIs from one group to the other, from the, the intervention group to the non-intervention group, that would have made the p-value for MI non-significant. So I think that's one issue. 
Um, the second issue was whether or not the, um, the non-intervention group received standard of care therapy. I think that most of us in our interventional practice, when we treat the infarct-related artery, if there are significant stenoses um, that should be risk stratified, be that with FFR, with um, uh, nuclear to try and gauge the, the amount of myocardium at, uh, at risk, many of those lesions in a usual or standard therapy group would have been treated. Mm -hmm. In this trial, um, there was no attempt to risk stratify and look at the, 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 the the, the, the amount of ischemia that that person was was potentially exposed to, um, that wasn't done. Mm -hmm. You were treated or you were not treated, and I'm not sure that that reflects contemporary practice, and I think that was a, a criticism, but I think an in-depth look at, uh, at the trial is, is certainly warranted, um, but its results were, were very provocative. To TAVI lectures, the TAVI dev device parade, that's always interesting and then there's quite a long session on coronary re revascularization in TAMI patients, the usual issue before, during or after. Um, I suppose people fall into three groups in terms of coronary revascularization with TAVI patients. Some people want to do everything, some people want to do nothing and some people take a more pragmatic viewpoint. Where do you stand as a TAVI operator? I think it depends on the patient, and I think it depends on the lesion. Um, I think there's good evidence suggesting that you don't have to fix all the stenoses um, to get a patient through TAVI. Um, but I think that as we move into lower risk patients and move away from our 85 year olds who have no options, I think we're going to need to try and offer surgical-like outcomes to our patients who would otherwise be receiving um, complete coronary revascularization and aortic valve replacement. Um, uh, and I think that no one has looked at um, uh, randomizing patients to treatment before, during, or after. Um, and no one has looked at functional significance of stenosis in these groups either, um, or indeed Again, the amount of myocardium at risk. I think at the moment, in the absence of such evidence, I think it should be individualized for, uh, for an individual patient. Yeah. What do you think the likelihood of getting a randomized trial is? I think probably quite low. I think the chances of a randomized trial on revascularization pre or post AVI is, um, are slim to none unless it's physician initiated. I think there are groups, however, out there who, who do do enough patients and perhaps, uh, perhaps a bunch of us can get together and, uh, and look at that. I think there's a UK trial that has started uh, investigator-driven, but I think they were struggling to recruit because people have such fixed ideas about what they should and shouldn't do. But it'd be interesting to see whether they come up with anything in it the next year or so. Uh, to round up, you've got an abstract. You are, you're certainly first author on it. I don't know if you're presenting it on TAVI in uh, bicuspid aortic valves. That's right. Um, we have a uh, multi-center, multinational registry, um, including 12 centers in Europe and Canada, where we have uh, 143 patients with bicuspid aortic valve treated with TAVI. Um, uh, the headlines from it are that the, um, the treatment appears to be safe, um, and feasible in terms of um, efficacy. Uh, overall, we had a 27% uh, rate of greater than mild um, power valve or leak. Um, some of that relates to the fact that CT sizing was only used in, uh, in two thirds of patients. And when we looked at patients who just had CT sizing, a power, or a greater than mild power valve or leak rate. Uh, dropped to about 15-16% with both the Edwards and the core valve systems. Mm -hmm. However, there are probably some structural reasons why we could get more power valve RD yeah. with, with, the, with the bicuspids. They tend to be more elliptical, they tend to be larger annuli, um, they tend to be more calcified and their pattern of calcification is quite different uh, to tricuspid AS. Um, and also the, in, in, in non-true uh, bicuspids where you have calcified rife, they can certainly, uh, we would think, um, prevent complete expansion of the prosthesis. But I think encouraging early data, um, uh, suggesting that, um, that the procedure is feasible, um, 
efficacy is going to have to be proven with a larger group. Good. There we go. That's today's roundup and a quick look at tomorrow. Uh, and we'll join you here tomorrow at the same time.